Thank you, Professor McLaren. We'll now hear from Thomas McMorrow. I wish to begin by thanking the organizers of this conference, as well as my fellow panelists for their thoughtful papers. I've also been asked by Rod McDonald, my co-author, to extend his regrets uh, that he's unable to attend due to illness. He told me that he's particularly um, regretful that he can't be here since the panel consists of the person, John McLaren, who hired him to his first academic post at the University of Windsor in 1974, and students from the five different decades in which he has taught at McGill University. Decolonizing the law school. We believe that the legal education establishment in Canada has been and remains dominated by powerful external forces in a manner that can be analogized to colonization. And we argue that the future of law school lies in its decolonization. We speak of colonization as a mode of control defined primarily by exogenous domination. In using colonization as a metaphor for domination of a particular educational institution, we do not suggest that the law school suffers the identical effects that human beings do under colonial oppression. We do, however, mean to underscore how, by their passivity, law schools risk being sites of alienation rather than education. Colonization works surreptitiously because members of colonized institutions either do not realize their subservient status, or they relish the thought of acceptance by the dominating offshore institutions. Successful colonization depends not just on a belief in its inevitability, but on the presumption of its necessity, a presumption often grounded in a sense of inferiority. We identify five interconnected forms of contemporary colonization of the law school. We present the law school as a site that each occupier seeks to colonize with its own distinctive ethos in disregard of the internal ethos of the law school itself. Of course, we contend that professors and students have the power, if not always the will, to resist. Our challenge, therefore, is to undertake a project of decolonization by reframing the ethos of the law school in a manner appropriate to the 21st century. First, intellectual colonization. Historically, Canadian legal education has been in the thrall of models from the leading foreign jurisdictions that have played an outsized role in Canada's political and economic life. This foreign intellectual domination has had several dimensions. Outsourcing of graduate legal education and professorial hiring, curricular design, course content, teaching materials and secondary sources not particularly attuned to Canadian legal normativity, and theoretical approaches uncritically parachuted into the often quite different vernacular context. Today, the intellectual landscape is somewhat different. Many Canadian doctoral programs are flourishing. Professors and students are undertaking research on Canadian law on its own terms, and not as a body of law that needs to adopt legislative and judicial solutions developed elsewhere. Interestingly, however, while the substance of the law has slowly been disanchored from US, UK, and French doctrine and practices, the theoretical approaches adopted by professors are still dominated by foreign tendencies. The future flourishing of the law school in Canada will require a sharp break from the patterns of intellectual domination that have characterized its past. Through most of the 20th century, the special advantages of Canada as a jurisdiction for innovative approaches to legal theory and legal education were largely ignored. Only recently have recognizably Canadian approaches to Aboriginal legal studies, comparative law, legal bilingualism, multiculturalism, and administrative and regulatory law emerged. The development of a markedly indigenous approach to law in which ideas from the global community are appropriated and transformed in the light of Canadian experience will be the driver of the decolonizing effort. Obviously, no institution achieves excellence by closing its doors to external influences. There must always be a place for the global circulation of legal ideas, the recruitment of foreign trained professors and graduate students, and the adoption of teaching and research methods pioneered elsewhere. But openness to influence is not domination. In brief, the problem with excessive foreign influence is that it rests on a misplaced need for external validation and the concomitant reliance on ways of addressing life through law that have not been put through the crucible of one's own experience. Second, professional colonization. The history of legal education in Canada can also be written in large part as an imperial project of the legal profession. The law school is simply a means to an end, admission to the profession. So successful has this colonizing project been that the notions of the law school as something other than career training and the law as something other than an artifact of the political state to be mastered and deployed exclusively by lawyers appear as interloping latecomers in the story. 
The recent move by the Federation of Law Societies to specify in detail the content of the undergraduate curriculum is not exceptional, but is merely the latest example of the profession attempting to assert control over the definition of legal knowledge. Despite the renewed push of the Federation to control legal education, it is unclear that the project will succeed in the manner intended. In any event, a much more insidious colonization by the profession lies in its constant presence within law faculties through sponsored coffee houses and other events meant to further the recruitment efforts of major firms. The challenge is to pursue a mission that goes beyond the wishes of lawyers and their governing bodies to embrace engagement with larger themes of citizenship, humanity, and virtue. The inherent challenge of legal education is not to simply produce lawyers or law professors who lawyer or profess law ethically, but also to enable people to grow in virtue through their study of law. Yet there's almost a certainty that law schools collectively will not summon the will to forsake professional accreditation as a curricular objective. Doing so would demand that they explicitly articulate an alternative conception, not only of legal education, but of law itself. That said, law schools must strive to overcome the narrow conception of legal expertise that currently dominates the worldview of both practicing lawyers and professors. When this occurs, the study of law will be understood as offering opportunities to learn how to attend to the complexities of human beings in interaction with each other, to identify and solve problems in relation to their immediate instantiations, their general implications, and their theoretical dimensions, to mediate experiences of the quotidian with the ideals of the transcendent, and to evaluate oneself and one's community in light of value-laden aspirations. That the study of law can boast no monopoly on any or all of these forms of learning reveals that receiving formal legal education is not the only way to grow in wisdom in the law. Third, market colonization. Economists will observe that law schools have always been subject to the discipline of markets. However informally, they competed for students, for professors, for funding, and for reputation. We use the term market colonization to focus attention on the fact that the logic of markets has now become a central component in the design and delivery of the law school curriculum and on the dominant role that measurables and rankings play in shaping law school decision making. We believe that markets are only one form or process of social ordering, that there are distinct realms of social interaction, and that the market is not always the optimal ordering process. Moreover, however useful as an evaluation metric, we believe that market analysis should not trump other modes for assessing associations built upon relations of mutuality or common aims. There are several reasons why market ideology came to drive legal education during the last quarter of the 20th century. Two of the more important are first, the rise of law and economics as a normative legal theory, and second, competition between Canadian law schools using statistics relating to average LSAT scores of admitted students victories in inter-faculty mooting and essay competitions, numbers of students placed in Supreme Court of Canada clerkships, and post-graduation success in the New York City job market as proxy evaluations of their quality. With the advent of the McLean's University surveys, the rankings of Canadian lawyer, and the scorecard of the Times Higher Education Supplement, among others, a number of law schools decided to make pursuit of the measurables adopted by these bodies the explicit goal of academic decision-making. Other components of the curriculum or the educational experience, however valuable in their own right, were downplayed in favor of activities that served to enhance a law school's competitive position. For law schools to escape colonization by the market, they will each need to develop and pursue a mission that is unique to its specific context, capacities, and intellectual aspirations. A collective failure of will in this endeavor will enable the best endowed faculties to set the terms of debate about the role of the law school and the criteria for judging excellence in a manner that ensures their premier ranking. The future of the law school in Canada depends on each institution contributing to the process of elaborating the diverse criteria by which excellence in legal education may be assessed and resisting the reductionist criteria by which ranking agencies shape the competitive market for legal study. Fourth, colonization by consumerism. Closely associated with the marketization of legal education is consumerism. Once law schools became preoccupied with rankings, they began to organize their various activities in response to student demands. Just as consumers can dictate by their expressed preferences which brands of soup a grocery store will carry, the customer is always right principle within the law school means that rather than students exercising a discerning role in academic governance, their preferences are called upon to, cons to control basic pedagogical decision-making. Almost inevitably, consumerism in education will lead to what 
Erwin Kotler once characterized as the student-faculty tacit conspiracy of mediocrity. Students will demand less of professors and rank teaching highly in exchange for professors demanding less of students and marking to a higher grading curve. Of course, not all students see themselves as consumers. And even among those who do, that is not the only manner of their self-perception. A return to the exclusion of students from faculty governance is no panacea for combating overweening consumerism, nor is it something we would endorse. Part of the challenge is inherent to all democratic practice. The politically engaged are sometimes in the game only for themselves or are driven by a nimbyism that constrains them from seeing beyond the fences of their own backyards. An important role of the law school is to provide intellectual resources as well as a social environment that nourishes an understanding of legal education beyond consumers. This means helping students to recognize and situate their concerns within the overall mission of the law school. The consumerist mentality also generates a sense that students are in an adversarial relationship, both with professors and each other. When things go wrong, the recourse is immediately to escalate the problem by launching a formal complaint to the relevant associate dean. Perhaps because students do not see their own political institutions as appropriate for such matters, or as really their own, or perhaps because they do not conceive themselves as having a stake in how decisions are made in the faculty beyond immediate results for them, they fail to recognize that they, as much as professors, are trustees of the institution, not just consumers of its products. Fifth, colonization by the herd. Every social institution endeavors to mobilize and coordinate the energies of its members without allowing them to fall into an unreflective uniformity. Colonization by the herd is anathema to independent thinking and inhospitable to honest, informed debate. The principle of conformity trumps all others. In Canadian legal education, the herd mentality has both internal and external facets. Uh, internally, the herd shapes the way in which law schools function and their members make decisions. Externally, the herd shapes the way individual law schools act as part of the herd to which they belong. What are the chances that a law school of the future can break free of the herd mentality? As a test, we might consider how to think about the recent attempt by Trinity Western University to obtain accreditation for its law school. The unique feature of this law school is its explicit orientation towards the education of lawyers who commit themselves to the pursuit of particular values and ideals. Unlike other Canadian law schools, TWU requires students and faculty to sign a community covenant under which they promise to live their lives according to its understanding of the prescriptions of the Christian Bible. The overwhelming majority of these commitments track the highest aspirations of the ethical practice of law. Yet, in popular discussions and in the brief filed by the Council of Canadian Law Deans, focus has been almost exclusively on the section of the covenant that elaborates commitments relating to traditional opposite-sex sexual morality. Given that faith-based perspectives on law are devalued within legal academic scholarship in how law is taught and in the way it is discussed in law school classrooms, one might well ask how welcome a fundamentalist Christian would feel at one of Canada's existing law schools. We have now added to a long-standing herd mentality that has traditionally discriminated against LGBTQ people, one that discriminates against those with strong religious beliefs both within law schools individually and among law schools as a whole. In the future, one might hope that law schools would be more tolerant of diversity, including the diversity implied by a commitment to a set of beliefs that may conflict with the dominating liberal ideology of other members of the herd. Fostering diversity by making space in course syllabi, classroom discussions, law school events, and informal associations for reasoned engagement with sincerely held beliefs is good pedagogy. It affords members of a learning, teaching, and knowledge-producing community the opportunity to bring their whole selves to engagement with law. We see the opposition of the CCLD to TWU's proposed law school as regrettable evidence of how swift and definitive the herd mentality can be. Significant pedagogical development of the past 40 years. In embracing these, two, these new technologies, be they internal teaching platforms like WebCT or externally oriented online resources like MOOCs, a law school's path of least resistance will be to let its online presence be an avatar of the colonizing forces we've just discussed. Left to its own devices, meaning absent prudent decision-making anchored in a clear sense of its distinctive ethos, enhanced communication technologies will serve as conduits for what is most readily communicable. In this way, the law school is absorbed into the colonial powers, becoming colonizer as much as colony itself. To the extent that law schools shop out content rather than analysis, peddle the ideology of legalism rather than spur demand for questions of justice, present a modest picture of state law rather than a pluralist vision of living law, 
The shift online will just mean that the law school can take its colonization project to the masses. In this light, the challenge for law schools is to transcend geographical boundaries without falling prey to intellectual deracination, to forge an extension of institutional identity that is not simply the peddling of a brand, to promote the ethos that law as a vocation presupposes rather than the present instrumentalist dispensation that control by the profession reinforces, and to gain fluency in new forms of intersubjective communication without losing the willingness or ability to express an authentic voice. As for the bricks and mortar institution itself, the incorporation of online learning permits professors and students to refocus the classroom experience so that no time is devoted to information acquisition and other activity that can be pursued online. In such a curriculum, questions of self-knowledge, ethics, and the exploration of virtue become the central feature of student-professor personal interaction. In conclusion, the current challenge for each law school is not simply how to mitigate what we have analogized to colonial domination. The challenge is also how to be and act so as not to itself become a colonizer. For professors and students endowed with the enormous social power that attends to their status as beneficiaries of legal education, the challenge is how to live, teach, and learn without acting as colonizers. Law professors must resist the temptation to speak ex cathedra about issues of social policy in a manner that silences other perspectives. And students must be careful in clinical placements and internships not to expropriate decision making from clients. We believe that the law school is best conceived as a civil association, a community of learners in quest of virtuous lives. We acknowledge that not everyone teaches or studies in law for the same reasons or in the same ways, but that each has the potential to find meaning in his or her participation to the extent one believes one can make a mark on the life of the institution and be shaped for the better by the experience oneself. The Manichaean construction of the profession and the university pulling the soul of the law school in different directions may be too narrow in that it mistakes the work of lawyers and legal officials in manipulating state law as being the only true vocation of legal expertise and formal institutionalized tuition in state law as the only way to learn about law. If, following the legal pluralist hypothesis, the law is everywhere, so too then must be its agents, and so too must be the law school. Law schools can provide opportunities for students to learn law in a multiplicity of sites and concomitantly become more diverse sites of normativity themselves through innovative, innovative uses of their physical, social, and intellectual space. Law schools must ask whether they are providing the opportunity, the inspiration, and the intellectual resources for all students to engage law through learning and engage learning through law. For the law school to really perform its public obligation, consumerism and the pursuit of renown must be treated as secondary to virtue. Notwithstanding the decreasing influence of foreign jurisdictions on Canadian legal education, it persists, and nearly everybody appears to be buying into it. We see the move of several law schools to adopt a U.S. degree designation, the JD, and Ivy League style fees to boast their Ivy League style pretensions, much more than the attempt by the Federation of Law Societies to control the tuition of law faculties with formalistic standards, as posing the graver threat to the distinctive ethos of the law school. Consider the following questions. Why is the law school in Canada a public institution? How can it best live up to that calling? What impact do outrageous fees have upon the law school's public mission? What does the adoption of a US degree designation say about the target markets for graduates and professorial scholarship? To be effective proponents of economic justice, participative political democracy, and social inclusiveness, law schools are faced with questions about the kinds of approaches to their mission they should adopt both internally, as a matter of everyday interaction among professors, students, and staff, and externally, as the way they position themselves in relation to the society of which they are part. There's no easy or universal prescription for addressing the challenges of the future. Every decolonizing law school, recognizing its unique geographic and social context, will be obliged constantly to formulate and reformulate how it meets them. This will involve an effort to understand and learn about law in the multiple formal and informal human associations that comprise modern society. Decolonizing the law school, as we present it, also means decentering state law. As such, it is foremost a reconstructive and not simply a deconstructive task.